Okay, Alice, I am so excited. I feel like this is such a privilege to get to talk to you like twice within the space of a few months. Um, mm -hmm. But lo and behold, you just keep cranking out these incredible cookbooks. <laughs> Oh, Desiree, it may seem like this has just come out of nowhere, but that's what happens when a book takes so long to get to your shores that uh, I kind of, I knew going to North America, going to Toronto with Joy coming a few months later was going to be very confusing for people, but you don't have to wait too long. Next fall, you will have the joy of better cooking in your hot little hands, but for now you just have to watch it and it's a delayed gratification for North America. Yeah. Well, and we still have time to sort of luxuriate in in praise of edge too, which is, you know, a, a book that I like, obviously I love because I'm all about the plants, but I just, you know, for me as a dietitian, but also as an eater, I think for so long, we've just sort of like said, well, you know, eat your vegetables. They're good for you without any sort of concept or paying any mind that, Hey, these are actually like really delicious. Like there are so many textures and flavors possible here. And what I love about in praise of veg is that you're like, look how good all of these incredible veg can be. Thank you. And I do, I agree with you. I think that In Praise of Veg is an evergreen book. It's not like one of those books that comes out and everyone goes, I'm so excited. And then you forget about it. You know, I'm still, when I'm visiting stores to sign copies of Joy, uh, the booksellers just keep talking about the fact that people will come back in to buy copies of Praise as gifts because they've already got it and they do feel like it's a gift. And I feel when I was writing it that I was sort of uh, paying a gift forward because I grew up knowing that vegetables are delicious. I grew up uh, knowing that they were the most exciting part of my plate. And that was the gift that my parents gave me, that my my family gave me growing up in Georgia, um, having veg breakfast, lunch, and dinner in really delightful, delicious ways. And simply, it's not like we were sort of tricking veg up, you know, it was just that we were eating them in season. Like for example, we were picking Georgian tomatoes. We were chopping them up um, tossing them together with some cucumber and some coriander or cilantro or some dill and uh, seasoning it and, and with a little bit of olive oil. And that was it, but that was our breakfast salad. And so already you start the day having had your three serves and then, you know, you could add red onion to that. Then you've got four, you could add capsicum. That's your five a day at breakfast. Yeah. And then it it just continues. And it's not because you should be eating the vegetables. It's not that I'm eating a bowl of vegetables first thing in the morning and thinking, oh, I'm fine now. I've had my five a day. <laughs> no, it's because it's enriching my life and enriching the meals. So I'm really happy to know that that's something that I, uh, that people are picking up, you know, that people are picking up what I'm putting down and, and that they're not stopping. And incredible. I mean, how few people, unless, and I, I think in North America, we're such big smoothie people that really the only time a veg is going to cross your lips before 12 noon is probably if you do a green smoothie. I love the idea of a salad for breakfast. Smoothies are so okay, right? They, they, I don't want to yuck anybody's yum because if you're listening to this and a smoothie is the way that you start your day, actually, you know, I do breakfast radio on a Saturday and my producer has one of those little smoothie machines that sits on her desk, those little battery operated ones. Yeah. And she makes us a morning smoothie and I will not say no to that, but texturally, I just love a bit of crunch. So yes, first thing in the morning, I'm having my breakfast salad. And if you haven't tried it, I want you to give it a go. And you spoke about your parents already. Were they big cooks? Like what was, what was the rule? Was, was food something that was just there? It's like, that is your fuel or, or did it really feel sort of like a, a central part of your life growing up? Food was always an occasion, whether we were eating it or making it. And it was always a family affair. So um, I can't remember a time where I wasn't involved in the process of cooking the food or, you know, picking the herbs or helping even just sort of pass the tomatoes along to make satsabella, which is like a Georgian version of passata or tomato sauce. So uh, that was just the, the way that I was immersed in food. I don't think it was necessarily conscious, but it's something that I see my mum doing with my with my daughter now, and it's uh, it's just such a, for want of a better word, it's such a joy to see that thread continue and to see those memories being made. And I do it too. Again, I think I'm a bit more conscious because of the space that I've worked in. You know, I've worked in the food literacy space for a decade and I know how important it is to involve kids in the kitchen, not just because you want them to eat the food, but because you're giving them skills for life. You're cultivating really kind of transferable, um, even sort of from a, the, the perspective of de dexterity, you know, from a Montessori system 
and you know, Steiner, uh, all of those kind of Waldorf practical skills are really important. Why not use the kitchen as an opportunity for learning and for engaging with those skills? So uh, when it's broad bean season, which it is at the moment in a Australia, I get, I grabbed the broad beans and I put her to work. You know, I actually had a segment uh, on breakfast telly uh, last month where it was broad beans and I needed to pod five kilograms oh of broad beans. <laughs> so both she and my husband were sitting on the ground, tearing open the first pod and then I blanched them. And then it was everybody, all hands on deck, potting the broad beans. And it's about kind of setting yourselves up to win. So we don't have one of those sort of learning towers at home yet. I keep meaning to get around to it, but actually she's now three and a half and she's at a point now where she wants to sit up on the kitchen bench or she'll sit up on a, mm -hmm. on a chair. So um, if you are thinking, oh, I don't have a learning tower, so I can't do it, bring the food to them, put it on the ground and pod the broad beans on the ground together on the rug. And that is actually a really kind of fun way for you to also reset because it's signifying to your body to just slow down and relax and do that together. And it's the kind of memories that they will not forget because I have not forgotten those memories either. And, you know, I'm deep into my thirties. Yeah. Oh, and just as you say, like I, you know, instantly these flashes came to me of cooking with my own grandmother and same thing, like she had this huge garden and that's exactly what we do. We'd be in the basement with massive buckets of like green peas or beans. And I mean, granted, I would eat most of them. i absolutely ate faster than I shocked. <laughs> but yeah. my grandmother did the work for both of us. <laughs> it's a, ha it's an occupational hazard, but actually I think that part of the intention too, because I was getting um, the nut hazel uh, to, to tear, um, to halve some beans yesterday, green beans. And I looked over and she'd eaten half the bowl, but I kind of <laughs> knew she was going to do that. And so th that doesn't matter. And I know too, we've got uh, our edible schoolyard is the kitchen garden program, the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation program. And whenever I visit a kitchen garden school, I see signs up in the garden saying, please do not eat the broad beans, <laughs> save them for the kitchen because these kids, <laughs> these kids are, are sort of sneaking into the garden at recess and picking broad beans straight off the pot and straight off the, the vine and eating them raw. So for any parent that thinks that it, that kids don't like vegetables or, oh, it's uh, impossible to get them to like them, grow them yourself, give them the opportunities to handle the veg. Don't make a big deal of it, but just make it a normal part of their lives. And you will be surprised, very pleasantly surprised. It is really, you know, when I think about how we've changed so much, like, and all of your work that you've done in education and, and teaching kids, you know, to sort of like embrace food and be curious about food and curious about flavors. There are so many people where families have deprioritized either by choice or, or by need, just deprioritize the idea of like food work and cooking. And yeah, the idea of sort of like sitting on the ground and taking some time to shuck some beans is actually kind of revolutionary for a lot of families and not, not in sort of the sense that like we all need to be quote unquote foodies or like food people, but like, this is just the work of a family. Like this is what we do reprioritizing, you know, the act of cooking and preparing food as a family is such an important thing to pass on. And you're right. It is a matter of prioritization and it is a privilege to be able to do that. And, um, and I think that for somebody who is in a, um, you know, where, where both parents work or perhaps they're a single parent and they have so many things that they need to prioritize ahead of, it's about finding those gaps or those opportunities. So I grew up, um, you know, when we moved to Australia, we, my parents had to work extremely hard. We came here with absolutely nothing and they both worked full time. And so Sunday was the day where cooking happened and my mum would make a big pot of borscht. Um, so which that great borscht in, in praise of veg is actually quite a sort of a dedication to that soup. And, um, she, that, that would be the process that she would involve us in. And that would be, we would come home from school every day. That would be our after school snack. And it would be our kind of touch point with our parents that, that, that was, that they, that we were cared for, that we were loved and that that was our moment to connect. Uh, and then they would come home much later and we would have kind of supper, but at least we would have had that meal already. Um, and it was, again, you know, that, that borscht has about eight serves of veg. So like Desiree, they are ticking the boxes <laughs> and the colors. But again, you know, if you don't have the opportunities throughout the week to connect as a family mm -hmm. over food, 
find a day on the weekend, make it a Saturday or make it a Sunday and that's your day. And it doesn't have to be all day and you don't have to be a foodie about it. You don't have to wake up early for the farmer's market, but (laughs) I highly recommend that you do because it's very fun and you'll find that it's actually more cost effective as well, particularly if you kind of um, go don't go first thing in the morning, go towards the end of the day and you'll be able to find some bargarinos at the farmer's market uh, or at the market if you're lucky enough to be in a place that has those sort of places or the green grocer. And then uh, and then you sort of process the food together as a family. And at first it does feel like it's time intensive because you're kind of having to teach those skills. But over time, like Hazel's three and a half and actually putting her to work with those broad beans makes my job easier rather than harder. Yeah. And, and the idea that you're doing it together too, and that children sort of grow up being like, oh, this is what it takes to feed a family. Because I think as parents too, you know, like there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes and our kids are just like, oh, all of these things magically present themselves to me at the appropriate time. <laughs> you're like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is the hard work that goes into feeding you kids. <laughs> Say thank yes. you once in a while. Yes. And I think you don't have to kind of say it as they're doing it, but I do think there's a different appreciation for food. So one of the kind of recommendations for that dietitians and nutritionists make for kids is get them involved in the process. And I don't think it's necessarily just because of the exposure. I also do think it's because they appreciate the amount of work that goes into it. So if you involve them, then the chances of them actually eating that food are much higher as well. Yeah, absolutely. I see it in my own life too. And I want to dig into this a little bit because you despite having this, you know, very firm uh, upbringing in food, you started your career as a teacher. I did. I just took a big chug of morning, morning, busy water. That was great. Um, (laughs) I did start my career as a teacher, um, but that's because my parents are both academics. So as much as, as much as food was a part of our lives, teaching or education was always held up as one of the most important sort of parts. And, and I didn't actually plan to be a teacher either. I, I was studying creative arts at university. Um, I was particularly interested in film and theatre and in writing. And the reason why I even walked past the education department and saw the sign is because I had gotten deep into my degree and realised that it was such a kind of esoteric, um, you know, the arts in terms of from a vocational perspective, you don't see in your early 20s how that can become a career. It's, it kind of feels like a pipe dream. So I tacked the teaching degree on because I thought, okay, well, I already know that this is vocationally practical and, you know, how bad could it be? And I get to take a year off my degree agree. I'm kind of done now. And then I walked into the classroom, Desiree, and it was like a light bulb went off in my head. A spotlight went on me. I was on a stage. I had my audience and I had these spongy young minds that I could mold and that were excited and interested to know what I had to say. And it really felt like home for me to be at the front of that class. And the reason why I ended up sort of transferring and translating those skills into food is because of those kids, because I would take them on school camps. And one of the kind of tasks of a year eight uh, teacher on those camps was to kind of set them jobs to get dinner on the table for everybody, you know, in the mess hall. And they didn't even know how to dice an onion. And these are kind of 12, 13 year old kids who will be moving out of home before you know it. And they don't know how to handle food, let alone cook a meal for themselves. So I knew that I needed to do something for them to get them a little bit further along in their journey, you know, get the flying hours up. And I, and I had this pipe dream again, I had this dream of creating an elective that was a food and culture elective that would expose these kids to new foods, to the history, to the uh, art, the culture of food. And when I pitched it to my heads of school, they said, well, that's a great idea, but you don't have the expertise and you don't have the skills. And so to get the expertise, I did a chef at home course at a TAFE where I did sort of every weekend for a whole year, I learned how to cook like an apprentice, essentially all of those kind of skills. And then at the end of that year, they were bumping out our course, bumping in Master Chef Australia auditions. And I figured if my kids saw me on the show, they would want to do my elective. So that was very much kind of like going with the flow. (laughs) And that recipe has turned into to very much a fully cooked career in food and food media and still to a different shaped classroom. Which is like the most incredible origin story I can ever imagine because you're like, (laughs) 
I know how to reach these kids. If I'm on television, they're going to love it. And then lo and behold, the siren song of TV called you into this new world of broadcast because, you know, I, and it makes so much sense with how you speak about cooking now. And I love hearing you talk about cooking because you weave this idea of teaching into it always. Like it always feels so informative and, you know, like you learn so much from you. And so like, let's start with the basics for people who are learning, listening and they're like, okay, so like, I love this. I love this idea of when I really can't cook. Like, I don't know how to cook. Like, let's start with something really basic. Like what makes something flavorful? Like why does some food taste good and not others? Well, the the real basic, uh, if you take it back to its origin and its source, the reason that food tastes good is because taste is nutrition. So science is increasingly showing that if a food tastes flavor dense, then it is nutrient dense. We are biologically designed to be able to taste when something is good for us in inverted commas. So a tomato, when picked at the peak of its season and eaten with, uh, we'll get to the flavorings very soon, but, but just even eaten like an apple, you know, bitten into, tastes like sunshine on a summer's day, tastes like a big, actually Anna Roche in, uh, in Praise of Veg describes it as like taking a big drink of cold water on a summer's day, just sweet and juicy and uh, runs down your cheeks and down your arm. And that is sunshine sunshine in a little in a little parcel so let's take that tomato that fully um nutrient dense peak season tomato and uh, peak season like my friend Dee Burek's book I love it I love that it's <laughs> coming, back, coming back to my people uh then you season it you need to season it and the reason why is because you want to create some dimension and you want to create some light and shade so a little sprinkle of salt flake will create the uh, kind of interplay between sweet and salty that makes the tomato taste sweeter. And what salt also does, which we learned from Samin Nosra, that's salt, fat, acid, heat, and Harold McGee's on food and cooking, is that it makes things taste creamier. So you've got that kind of creamy, sweet, salty, uh, juicy tomato in your, it's no longer in your hand, you've chopped it up, it's in a bowl. <laughs> Let's be sensible. <laughs> okay, so here it is. Then you're thinking, okay, so I've got that kind of basic what can I add to that to really zhuzh it up what grows with tomatoes what goes together grows together and vice versa what grows together goes together and two vegetables that grow together very well are tomato and basil uh, they're kind of companion planters because they also the basil um, means that the tomatoes get less bugs and vice versa so they enrich the soil really well they grow together really well and they also go together flavor wise very well. So you pop a few basil leaves on top of your tomato, uh, torn. That's it. I'm salivating. <laughs> so you you torn the tomato, you torn the basil leaves over the tomato, and that's going to create a herbaceousness. And it's a her herbs are always just a delight. But what they do is that they signify to your taste buds and to your like from an aroma perspective that you're about to you know, the full shebang, you're ready, get ready, get ready, body. you're going to start salivating, you're going to live your best life. Then you've got to think about finishing the dish. So what I mean by that is you'll see often in recipes, you know, finish with olive oil. Uh, so olive oil or any kind of sort of finishing oil is a really delicious, creamy addition. But what it also does from a nutrition perspective is that it makes the lycopene in the tomato more bioavailable. So you're drizzling with this olive oil, ideally local, ideally fresh, uh, which will be fruity and zippy. Maybe it's a little bit grassy, a little bit green. And you've just created a really simple, you know, um, Italian style tomato and basil salad. But what you've also done is that you have created a two, three, four ingredient, if you count the salt, uh, flavor bomb that is absolutely cooking. I know it's just like chopping up some tomatoes and tearing up some basil, but you have absolutely cooked. And that is probably going to be more delicious than going to all the effort of buying an eight or nine or 10 ingredient salad where nothing is in season, nothing has been seasoned and everything kind of tastes like a schmozzle together. Mic drop. 
Exactly. <laughs> and that is the final word on cooking from Alice Aslowski. That's all we need. <laughs> but it's so true. And I think, you know, we, we make it so much more complicated than it has to be. And, you know, for us here in Canada, we are entering the cool season. So, you know, we, we actually had a very late summer. So I had tomatoes until two weeks ago on my vines, but, you know, we're getting into those root vegetables and, you know, what's available locally is changing. And it's this idea that, no, we're not eating strawberries that have been shipped in from halfway across the world. Like this mm -hmm. nature is telling us what to eat right now. You know, it's time for nature the tells you. Yes, it's time for the beets. Tell me why. Tell me why, Dee. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's time for the beets in so many ways because they're going to last through the cold storage. We were meant to keep them through the cooler months. They also are going to offer us so many incredible phytochemicals, the beta lanes, the leaf greens, which absolutely I love to pickle. Do you pickle them? I don't pickle them. I put them through soups and I oh. also uh, blanch them and blitz them through pali, which is like a nutty Georgian dip. And I actually have a recipe for that in the Joy of Better Cooking. So um, you can, uh, in fact, if you're, you don't have to wait till fall, shoot me a DM and I'll send you the recipe for that. Perfect. <laughs> How do you pickle the, the beet leaves? What are you doing? Um, all I'm doing is making them into a quick pickle. So I love to, so I chop them up. So I chop up the stems. And then I add the leaves at the very last minute. And I just love it almost like you, you can't even call it, you can't call it a sauerkraut, but just that idea of that just nice, like salty sort of pickled flavor as a little bit of a condiment. I love it. Yum. Thank you. That is going to end up in my next book. So <laughs> <laughs> with attribution. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for people who are new to this and they're like, okay, so I get this. So I need a little bit, I need to season things properly. I need to make sure that I don't shy away from oil. Cause especially in nutrition, I find people there's this whole oil thing is coming back again. And, you know, newsflash oil is critical for carrying flavor. Just as you mentioned so beautifully, so many nutrients, including phytochemicals are fat soluble. So the addition of oil makes them more bioavailable. Um, but how, how did you first learn because one of the things that changed cooking for me was that I used to make things and not taste them. So I used to make the dish, pop it in the plate, sit down to it and be like, oh, this doesn't taste right. <laughs> Cause I would never taste the food. And so one of the things that changed cooking the most for me was like, no, you taste as you go along. It's like, like, let's taste this. Ooh, this, this seems hollow somehow. It seems flat. Okay. I'm going to add a little bit more cumin or, you know, this is seeming a little bit bitter. We're going to add like just a tiny pinch of sugar just to round that out. What, what are some of the tips for you that really changed the way that you cooked and the way you thought about building flavor? Taste is, is so important, as you say, and it is something that I didn't learn to do until probably even sort of halfway through MasterChef, I'd say I wasn't tasting my food. And we had the judges, the the three guys, Gary, Matt and George say, guys, we need you to taste your food because when we taste it, it's not working. So um, I think sometimes, particularly when you are nervous or if you're cooking out of fear, which if you are a new cook, often you are, you're kind of thinking you're, you're second guessing yourself or you're doubting your own instincts. You forget that actually you know, the most important instinct is uh, your own taste, your own kind of um, natural intuitive process of putting spoon to mouth. So have some sort of set yourself up with some little moments within the kitchen to remind you to do that, whether that's in a professional kitchen, you would have a little jar with, with water and some little tasting spoons next to you by the cooktop. So that might be something that just kind of reminds you to taste as you go. And I know that I get not one, but two spoons because you can taste with the tip of the spoon and taste with the end of the spoon. <laughs> and, and you should be seasoning as you go. So you don't pour all of the salt in at once. You can season right at the start, just a, t a light sprinkle. And then right at the end after you've tasted, or even I under season my food on purpose because kids don't need as much salt. Um, you know, they actually experience the food as saltier than, than you do. And so what I do is I have the salt flakes on the table and then people can season to their own tastes because that's the other thing too. I think some people, when they're just starting out are nervous to cook for others because they don't want to let them 
them down or they don't want to let themselves down. So put things on the table to put the onus back on your diners to make the food taste good for them. It's a little choose your own adventure. So whether you've got some uh, a pepper grinder and some salt flakes and some olive oil and my other real tip is put some garlic powder on the table as well. Yes, there's a brand. I'm pretty sure you would have it in the States because I think uh, we get it on iHerb. So it's a, a, a Simply Organics or Absolute yes. Organics Green Lid Best Garlic Powder. I had that. At, so I, we had some, those green beans, the ones that, you know, the half the green beans that weren't eaten. I blanched them, uh, just seasoned them very lightly and uh, and then popped plenty of garlic powder on top and on olive oil, tossed it together. That was it. And it was so tasty because we got those green beans in a CSA, a community supported agriculture box. So they were already tasty to begin with. You don't need to add any more stuff to them to make them good. So that's a real kind of the reason why the garlic powder is on the table is because what garlic does, uh, particularly for garlic lovers, which if you're listening to this podcast, you're absolutely a garlic lover, uh, <laughs> is that it you know, you mentioned rounding out, it kind of creates a depth of flavor. And even if you forgot to kind of build the flavor at the top or at the, at the start of the cook, you can finish it with that garlic powder and it suddenly tastes like you put a lot more time into it. Garlic and onion powder. So I just Oof. finished <laughs> writing my fourth book and because I'm plant fully plant-based, garlic and onion powder are my umami bombs. Like when I want to convince someone who eats dairy and meat that vegetables can be as delicious. It is garlic and onion powder all the way. Even though I also have fresh onion, I also have fresh garlic, but it's just, they do something they do. They, they give it that depth, that little hit that nothing else replaces. That's it. Alliums. Alliums equals umami. And whether you're caramelizing or sweating or powdering towards the end, you are onto a winner. So yeah, that's, I, I can't wait for your fourth book. When does it come out? maybe a year from now. I don't have a date yet. So it's supposed to be the end of 2023, but it might end up being like the beginning of 2024. So we'll see. No, we'll keep our eyes peeled. <laughs> so this is kind of the perfect place to, to segue a little bit, because when I was doing a little research on you, I discovered you have your own line of condiments. So I feel like I have to ask you, if you were beyond garlic powder, if you were to gift like a newbie, a collection of like condiments and spices that you thought would make everything taste better. Like what else would you add to sort of that flaky salt, garlic powder, olive oil scenario? So definitely some pepper. We have white and black pepper that we use. So white pepper for cooking, black pepper for finishing, um, you know, with a few cracks, because when you crack open an, a black peppercorn, you get this really gorgeous floral aromatic. When you crack open a white white peppercorn it smells like hay bales and a little bit barney so, <laughs> so that's why I make make that distinction uh then I would have let's go wet things first so mustard a Dijon mustard or a seeded mustard or both if you're a mustard fan um the reason why is Dijon's really great for adding to dressings and it's also kind of got a, enough heat that you could use it as just like a plain condiment on a plate like a horseradish kind of situation um, and the seeded mustard, I just, I just like the look of it and I like the pops of mustard seeds in your mouth. So definitely a fan of that. Um, honey or maple syrup. <laughs> I mean, maple syrup, let's face it. I came home actually from Toronto with like four bottles of maple syrup and I, and I declared it in my quarantine and, um, and they sort of stopped me and said, what have you got? I said, maple syrup. And they said, come on, go ahead. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I wanted to do the right thing. Uh, so definitely some maple. And then um, I would have vinegar. So whether it's a red wine vinegar or um, and or apple cider vinegar and or a white wine vinegar. And the reason why is uh, red wine vinegar really great for dressings. Uh, I find that it's kind of got more of a, a the tannic roundedness that I like for Italian dishes, white wine vinegar though is probably more neutral. So if you just wanted one vinegar and you just like, I don't know how, how big this hamper is going to be, Desiree. So as big as your dreams. <laughs> okay, great. So then you got white, red, and maybe a balsamic too. And you don't have to fork out for a really expensive balsamic vinegar. You can fake a balsamic, an aged balsamic, and this is blasphemy. So, you know, block your ears if you don't want to hear this, but uh, there's a recipe in Praise of Veg for like a cheats aged balsamic where you reduce cheap balsamic from the shops with, with maple syrup. 
and you reduce it down, you know, at a high vigorous boil until it really kind of um, thickens up to a syrup and it thickens faster than you think. So once it's sort of reduced by half, it's probably already thickened enough. And then once it cools, you can drizzle it like a barrel aged kind of, I know, five year old balsamic. <laughs> people will not even know. And, uh, so that's a, that's a great tip. And then you've got things like your, um, tomato paste. I think it's really important that you've got a good quality tomato paste because that really can round out and add anytime that you're adding tomato sauce or toma tinned tomatoes to something, adding tomato paste is like adding an, another tin, but also an hour of time. So one of my condiments in my Bialis range, I've got two at the moment. So one is uh, just two ingredient tomato paste and black garlic paste. So mm -hmm. black garlic spread. So those two ingredients together, you can use just like a teaspoon of that in your cooking, like in your bolognese or anytime you use tomato products, or you can spread it on toast like a, like a mite you know, kind of like a, uh, with avocado or poached eggs and or poached eggs and or butter and or cheese, delish, uh, plant-based cheese, ex excellent. And again, umami bomb because black garlic, I know that you guys are just getting black garlic. Mm. We're very much just getting black garlic. It, I was just in the UK that it's so new. I was at Barra Market and there were only a few stalls that had black garlic. So this is, black garlic is like the next what would I say? I think black garlic is as exciting as black truffle. Uh, it's it's a it's garlic that's being cooked at a really low temperature for forty days, so it really kind of activates the sweetness and the umami, the natural umami. It ferments the garlic, and so it's a real. Um, you don't need, need to add much, but it really lifts a dish and takes it to a completely new place of flavor. It's sweet. It's so it's savory. It's um, rich. It's just, um, 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 uh, then I would add to our little condiment collection. Uh, I, I, it just depends, you know, I'm being very kind of um, Eurocentric in our, in our choices. So I would absolutely think about things like soy sauce, um, light and dark, depending on what the person is cooking. I would absolutely be adding sesame oil to that, you know, whether that's for dressings or for um, adding to, to stir fries. I would be thinking about having um, fish sauce as well. So whether that's anchovy sauce or fish sauce, I think you guys have Mega Chef as a brand. That's a, a brand that's pretty available around the world. So definitely oyster sauce again. Um, and if you're not, if you're plant-based, then you could be using mushroom sauce instead of oyster sauce. Those two are really good friends. Um, and then I would be thinking, you know, some rice seasoning, you know, the furikake, which you can buy, just like pop in the fridge and add on top of steamed rice or on top of uh, any kind of veg, toss that together. Om, om, om. And um, and in the, if you needed a vinegar, then you could think about something like a, um, a mirin, um, you know, or a rice wine vinegar to add to your collection. So in doing so, I think we've kind of covered some of the bases of some of the cooking that you can be doing. And I know that it already probably feels overwhelming, but if you look at it on a pantry shelf, then that's like a world of flavor that you can start off and, and do a lot of fun things with. And it's something that people can accumulate over time. And I know all of my recipes always have a lot of ingredients because there are a lot of spices. There are a lot of herbs, <laughs> but that then you can take whatever is available. And you can take something that simply, you can take a few veg, you can take a little bit of rice and make so many different flavors with it. And so I think that people tend to shy away from really stocking their spice drawer and stocking their pantry with all of these delicious things. But once you do, they last for a long time. And then you have like all of the flavors at your fingertips. You do. And then the world is your oyster sauce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I haven't even, I haven't even started on spices, but again, it really depends on which kitchen you're kind of leaning towards. But if you've got things like, um, some curry powder, some, uh, coriander, some cumin, um, have you got a favorite spice, Desiree? What, what, where do you uh, go? cumin and, uh, cardamom. Like cumin oh. goes into almost everything. It's my grandmother cooked with a lot of cumin. And so it literally flows through my veins. Like I, I know very few recipes aside from perhaps, you know, tomato and basil that like can be like elevated by cumin. <laughs> wow. So, and, and cumin really does love root vegetables. So yeah. coming into, yeah, your, your cooler months, definitely, um, ground or, you know, whole cumin seeds just tossed together, maybe honey or maybe some, um, or maybe maple. So maple, cumin, um, 
maple cumin, red wine vinegar, toss, 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 and or pomegranate molasses instead of red wine vinegar, actually. Roast up some carrots, uh, olive oil, yum. Um, yes. And uh, I'm a bit the same with coriander, actually, like coriander seeds and ground coriander. My mum, anytime a recipe is missing something, it's probably coriander as far as my mum's concerned. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're right. It's about that kind of the memories that those spices evoke and the aromas evoke. I want to circle back to, you said something about the texture of mustard seed. I'm an absolute mustard addict, both grainy and Dijon. We go through a lot of it, but I want to talk a little bit about texture because, you know, from my past, when I was in my twenties and just learning to cook, you know, everything was like very roughly large piece chop. Like I was the queen of a Greek salad. Like that's what I would do. (laughs) I would chop all my veg like that, no matter what it was. And one of the things that really changed my own cooking was learning how much texture changes things like getting a really fine dice on the onion. So it melts into a sauce or, you know, shaving something really fine on a mandolin because I have terrible knife skills so that like you're, you don't have a lot to crunch through in a salad. Like what are some of the ways that we can use texture simply to sort of change our meals? Well, especially if you're just starting out, the number one tip I have for you to change texture is have a knife that's sharp, just one, uh, because it's, it's one thing to know that you need to find ice on an onion, but it's another to try and achieve that with a letter opener. So definitely, <laughs> you know, don't go out and buy a whole kit of knives, just one good sharp chef's knife. You'll actually cut yourself less with a sharp knife than you will with a blunt one. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is if you are just starting out, you don't need to cut it all by yourself. You can get some tools. So, um, you know, you mentioned a mandolin, just make sure you use the guard. So for a really fine, let's say radish quickle, mandolining the radishes really, really finely, and then popping them with an equal parts sort of vinegar, sugar, Um, salt flake or salty um, solution, maybe juniper berry in there, or maybe if you've got some caraway, that could be really yummy in a quick pool. Yum, yum. Uh, Then I have a julienne peeler, which I love using for things like green mango salad, or even for a coleslaw, I might use a julienne peeler, or if you've got a julienne attachment on your mandolin, that could work. But even just as simple as having a microplane, um, that will make a huge difference. So micro, a, a really fine microplaned uh, cloud of Parmesan cheese instead of using the coarse grate or a grater that's sort of going a little bit blunt will completely change your experience and make you feel like you're in a really fine dining restaurant. You can also finely shave nuts. So whether that's a macadamia nut or an almond, so the experience of that same fine shaving cloud Rather than using cheese, you can use nuts and you'll still get that kind of, you know, that probably more chefy experience, right? Um, Then a, a, a food processor. So use the grading attachment on your food processor because think about it this way. The smaller something is, the faster it cooks. So if you're in a hurry, grating up your veg to either saute it or to make a soup out of it means that you can do that much quicker. You know, there's that risotto in um, in, in Praise of Veg, the pumpkin risotto, which uses um, grated pumpkin and it's much quicker. And the same goes for the seven spice tagine that uses both grated butternut squash and chopped up butternut squash. And it's about kind of playing with texture with the same vegetables. So it's not like you're going out and buying two, but you're actually kind of softening one and keeping one to have a little bit of bite. That is such a game changing tip because for so many people, one of the reasons why they don't add as many vegetables to their meals, they're like, oh, well, it takes a long time to like chop and cook all of these veg. But if you have a food processor, grating all those veg takes exactly 30 seconds. It isn't that. There it is. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) cooking them is even faster. And then you just put all these veggies in your plate and it took no time at all. Totally. It actually reminds me of a challenge on MasterChef where we had to cook for, I think 500, it was like a 500 person wedding. And none of us thought to use the food processors on the sides (laughs) of the the (laughs) kitchen. So we were doing everything by hand, you know, coarsely grating. And I remember someone, sort of one of the judges coming in and saying, what are you doing? And just sort of pointing out. So we kind of, we kind of make things harder on ourselves than they need to be. We do. Absolutely. Okay. I would love to get your advice for another ingredient that sometimes freaks people out if they didn't grow up eating it. And that's tofu. 
because I oh. tofu fan club number one right here, but I know it's still an ingredient that people are like, I'm not sure what to do with it. What, what do you love doing with tofu? Tofu is an ingredient that definitely, if you grew up with it, you understand it and you can cook with it and you appreciate its wobbliness. Uh, whereas, yes, if you if it's new to you, it is very foreign. So I think that what you can firstly do is access the internet and all of those amazing cooks who are using tofu. Like um, I love watching what the, the Korean vegan um, is one account that I really, really, really love on Insta, um, but also Zachary Bird. So he's a vegan butcher. And one of the tips that I got from Zach is that if you freeze your uh, um, soft tofu and then you let it um, thaw, it actually gets the texture kind of like a chickeny texture. Um, yeah, and and tear that up and, and that's really, really fun. Um, I also really love tossing silken tofu in a little bit of, um, or soft tofu in a little bit of uh, corn flour and frying it for, you know, like the most scrummy, scrum diddly umptious um, uh, uh, tofu, you know, salt and pepper tofu dish. Um, but also what I love beyond tofu is tempeh. Tempeh mm -hmm. is my favorite kind of soybean product, a marinated tempeh, which you can chop up kind of into to pieces, almost like uh, beef like pieces, and then toss that stir fry the tofu, uh, the tempeh as your stir fried protein ingredient. That is a or even don't even worry about chopping it, crumble it, crumble it almost like a mince through your stir fry. That's really scrumptious. So um, both, you know, fan of both of those, but of course with tofu, my big wreck is to make sure that it's organic. Cause I think a lot of people get stuck. They think, oh, this is, this is healthy. This is, I'm going to eat this and feel good. But if you're kind of buying GM soybean products, uh, you're not, and eating them quite regularly as well, particularly if you're plant-based, you're not going to have a good time. I love that you love mm -hmm. tempeh. I feel like it's the underappreciated cousin of tofu. You know, it's so much more flavorful. It's for the people who don't love the softer texture of tofu. It's got so much more tooth to it too. Yes. Tempeh is like the girl with the glasses and the ponytail. Once you take off the ponytail and the glasses, she's a babe. <laughs> so you really need to give tempeh a go. And particularly the reason that I like the, the marinated one is because it's already got heaps of flavor infused into it. Uh, and, and soybeans, you know, all beans are so starchy and absorb flavor really well. So you'll find that that kind of adds kind of like an aged, um, you know, a dry aged steak property to whatever you add it to. Yeah. And I think it's really nice, those pre-marinated versions. And usually the, the type that we have here most commonly is a smoked tempeh. So it's got that sort of smokiness to it, but for Oof. people who aren't sure what to do with it and aren't sure how to build flavor, it just, there you go. The flavor is there. Use at will. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I haven't, I haven't found much smoky smoked tempeh in Australia. I'll have to seek some out. Yeah. You do like sort of like a little tempeh bacon scenario, which is very delicious. Oh, great. I had someone ask me, I've got a, a pumpkin, like a sky high pumpkin pie in a cookery column from the weekend. And someone said, what do I do instead of bacon? And I said, add some extra leek and, and some paprika for the smokiness. But next time I'm going to say, find yourself some smoked tofu, yeah. the smoked tempeh. Yum. Yeah. Either smoked tofu, smoked tempeh. I'm, I'm here for all of it. Good. Good one. <laughs> okay. I want to ask for people who are trying to get more into cooking and there's Still at that starting point, they're like, okay, so I'm building my pantry. I'm trying to seek out these recipes that are really easy for me. What are a few back pocket recipes you think every cook should have in their rotation? Just whip out on a Wednesday night and you're like, no worries, dinner in 30. Uh, I've got a whole chapter of these that I call my autopilot recipes. Enjoy. Oh, and um, yeah, oh, it's because they're the ones that we absolutely do. I, I've got one. Um, so my pantry puttanesca is like, in case of emergency, break tins open. So uh, it's a pasta dish. You can use any shape you want. And then you're grabbing some tins of tuna or you don't have to, if you want to keep it um, vegetarian, you don't have to use the tuna. You can just have extra olives and capers. And uh, so tomatoes, are either chopped tomatoes, tinned or cherry three tomatoes from the tin or passata, whatever you've got, and some uh, tomato paste as well. And the first thing you're going to do is fry the capers until they're crispy, pull them out. That's going to be like your topping. And then you're going to fry your olive oil, your olives in olive oil as well. And olives are another real kind of umami bomb ingredient 
recipient where someone else has done all the work for you. So you're really kind of, you know, frying them off and caramelizing the sides so that they become even meatier. And then you're adding um, butter if you want to, or just extra olive oil and um, some garlic and tomato and kind of, you know, a Marcella Hazan style tomato sauce uh, and simmering that down while the pasta cooks. So all of this is happening while the pasta cooks. And by the time the pasta, the dried pasta cooks, you've got this sauce that you can then add the pasta into a mug full or half a mug full of pasta water. That's important as well to kind of thicken up the sauce and then finish with the capers. You know, if you're using tuna, the tuna goes in just before the pasta goes in and then you're tossing that about, finish it with Parmesan or plant-based cheese and capers and another glug of olive oil, cracked pepper, salt. That is something that you can make every single week. It's something that you have in the pantry ready to go and that is, it never fails to delight. And if you do have kids at home that you're trying to introduce to interesting kind of umami flavors, uh, then that's a really great familiar dish for them to learn to like capers and olives and tuna and um, and whatever else you want to add into it really, because you could be grating other vegetables into that as well once you've got that base. It's so true. We, we talk about that a lot as dietitians that, oh, if you want to introduce new foods, introduce them into a more familiar format. So if you've got a veg that, you know, your children aren't too into it's like well here's pasta with this veg but it works on grown-ups too 100 percent. and the key though is with the mindset don't think that you're hiding or sneaking those vegetables in you're actually heroing the vegetables inside something that's already familiar so you're saying like here's your friend pasta plus your new friend zucchini <laughs> <laughs> they're already besties therefore you are going to be besties correct Okay. So I, uh, we're going to shift into rapid fire in just a second, but as I was doing research for this episode, I, you know, I don't know how you do it all. So you now have like two incredible cookbooks. You have a radio column, you have a TV hosting gig, you have the condiments. You also have a magazine column. Like, tell me when you sleep also as a parent, when do you sleep? Um, no word of a lie. I sleep between the hours of, uh, so it, I sleep between nine and three and then five and seven, maybe eight if I'm lucky. So between three and five, I'm either in bed um, ruminating or I get up and do some work. And the great thing is that those hours, like, and this is something actually, nat it's quite sort of natural for people to sleep in those kind of cycles. Um, I think it unfortunately is something that's just happened to me, particularly after I was, um, you know, breast sleeping for, for so long, your body's just like, oh yeah, this is what we do now. And it's like, no, yeah. we don't, we sleep now, <laughs> but I just can't. So now that that's my extra two hours of work. So maybe I get up and I write some you know, write some words, or maybe I'll just read a book if I don't want to expose myself to blue light at that time, that might help me sleep more. But really the answer is that I sleep as much as I can, but I'm just really passionate about what I do. And I just, the thing is, I, I guess people say, never make your hobby, your job. But in my instance, the reason why I just get so much done is because if I'm having a rest day, the way that I rest is I cook or think about food so I guess um, on those days and I, they, they do happen where I'm like oh where I don't feel like it all I have to remind myself is that I get to do this I get to do this with my life and all it takes actually is one email in the inbox to say hey I cooked your pumpkin pie on the weekend or hey I'm doing I'm cooking this tonight I'm just wondering blah blah to remind me that I am so privileged to get to do what I do and such a, what a life, like what an opportunity. And, and it's just kind of only really just at, at the beginning, like this is my, this is, I'm 10 years now. So I was three years a teacher. Now I'm a decade in the, in the food space. And, uh, and I get to meet people like Darina Allen, who's been working in the food literacy space for, because uh, I was in Dublin. So Darina's got Ballymaloo Cooking School and she's been doing this for sort of five, six decades. So what else can I achieve? How many more people can I, can I meet? Can I connect with? Can I encourage to get into the kitchen and just have a play? Um, God, I, I could not have imagined standing in front of those 30 kids that that food and culture elective would now be <laughs> so broad and so, uh, so kind of helpful, I guess, useful. 
useful. If I can have a useful life, then I'll be very, very happy. So beautiful. And Sleep we're deprived, all the- but happy. <laughs> <laughs> and happiness is really what's key at the end of the day. That's it. And I should say, so this book um, has not yet come to Australia, come to to North America, but my first book, my first pancake was actually a a cookbook for kids. So like a food, food book called Alice's Food A to Z. So maybe I can twist appetite Penguin Random's arm into sending A to Z over to your shores as well. (laughs) We need it. We absolutely need it because I think children have They are, they're just, as you mentioned, they are sponges. And if we can introduce the idea that food is such an important part of their life, that not only are they nourishing their bodies, but they're taking times away from the screens that are completely ubiquitous in their world and taking this time to, you know, get their hands dirty, do something tactile and just, you know, get into this really beautiful space of the here and the now and the chopping and the sizzling, and they'll be so much happier for it. So much. And they'll have those skills for life. Yeah. All right. This is the perfect point to shift into rapid fire. So I've got five rapid fire questions for you. Okay. The first one being first thing you ever love to cook. Uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, pasta Alfredo out of the, out of the, the uh, box, <laughs> you know, like a continental pasta Alfredo. Um, I'm, I'm sort of thinking when we came to Australia and this is like, you know, it's the first thing that I, I Maybe I would say that, you know, no, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to replace that because I didn't first learn to cook that. The first thing that I learned to cook was, um, little chat potatoes, little baby potatoes, yep. slice of cheese on top, dried chives on top of that little splash of water in the bottom and into the microwave. So that was my like after school snack that I taught myself how to cook, um, you know, as well as the, the so the borscht would be my first sort of food when I got home and then I'd have those potatoes. So that was great. The pasta Alfredo um, was kind of concurrent with that and I would just sort of stir the boiling water through that and that was something that I'd cook for the family. So those two things. I rem- <laughs> you know I remember what I like rapid fire commitments one. <laughs> I love that. I remember those pouches. Well, there were so many of those pouches that we had here in Canada. Absolutely. Like an Alfredo style, all the pouches. Oh, I was on that. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) And I think, you know, Desiree, if someone had said to us, oh, that's not cooking or that's cheating or that it's not healthy, whatever, whatever kind of limitations people set on themselves and on others, I would have felt intimidated, but no one ever said that. So I think we need to just meet people where they are and let them learn. Yeah. And I think we need to, we need to drop judgment in food and nutrition entirely, because if that person had the foresight to purchase that ingredient so that they had something to prepare at home, as opposed to picking up takeaway on the way home or ordering in some pizza, like that is already a commitment to feeding themselves beyond the basics. So I think it needs to be applauded. Agreed. Agreed. And I, um, I actually, who did I hear? Someone, um, at, at food on the edge in Dublin said that a fifth of the food that's consumed in North America is done so in a car. So, you know, if we can move people, uh, you know, a fifth of those people towards just kind of cooking a a packet pasta at home, then saying, Hey, you can add a veg to that, or you can make that pasta from, from scratch. And here's how, and it doesn't have to be a, a difficult thing to do. I think that we could really kind of move, shift the needle much faster than saying, no, you have to start here. You have to do scratch cooking right away. I agree. Okay. You have 20 minutes all to yourself and you are not allowed to be productive. What do you do? Not allowed. Don't even try it. (laughs) Uh, I read. I, um, I inhale books. You can see my bookshelf, some of my bookshelf behind me, and I've got such a huge to be read pile. So I would tuck up under a blanket with my book and my toasted sunflower seeds. And I would just have those 20 minutes to just like a little bird eating and reading. Perfect. Okay. Coffee or tea? Uh, it depends. My, um, I've, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge coffee drinker in terms of, I really appreciate coffee and we've got a really great coffee machine and uh, we've got a filter coffee machine and an espresso machine. So like, I think probably I'd say coffee, but I really love in the evenings, a cup of tea, like a rose tea. And Australians know how to do coffee so much oh. better. I mean, we're, we're catching up. But I, yeah, Australians know how to do coffee. 
I came across, like stumbled across a, a cafe uh, in Toronto on, I want to say it's like on one of the main drags and it's called The Library and actually it's owned by, um, part owned by an Australian and it does fantastic, right near the, the art gallery, mm -hmm. fantastic coffee. So if you find yourself somewhere around there in a series about coffee, that's a really great place. On the way to Kensington Market, that's where I was going. <laughs> we, we will put it in the recommendations link. And now the next time I go to Toronto, I'm going to have to, I was just there, but the next time I'm there, I'm going to have to search this place out. Do okay. it. <laughs> Food you just don't love, no matter how hard you try. Oh, um, oh I'd say, so I'm trying, I'm really trying to love uh, bitter melon. And if it's done well, then it, it works, but it's such a challenging ingredient to cook for yourself. So I'm, I'm working on it. I really am, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I try not to yuck anyone's yum, Desiree. So that's yeah. why I find that, that question really difficult. And actually, no, you know what I do find it even more challenging than that is Vegemite because I didn't grow up with it and it's kind of. If it's such a ubiquitous Australian food that everybody expects everyone to love, but it's just, um, I never kind of acquired that taste. So if someone says to me, you know, it's a Vegemite macaron, I'll eat it, but it won't be the one that I'll reach for first. Yeah, it is. We, we don't consume Vegemite or Marmite here. Like, unless you have the heritage, like we don't consume those here in Canada as well. But I have to say, we have this ingredient called better than bullion here, which is like a bullion concentrate which is so delicious. I have been known just to put the faintest. I was like, oh, this is essentially like Marmite, but like the bullion version. <laughs> I need to try that. That sounds amazing. Is it a spread? Is it a, what does it look it's like? So it is a, it is a very thick, it looks almost like blackstrap molasses in the consistency, but it's a bullion concentrate. Like it is, you want an umami bomb. It is it. And just delicious. That is not from my official nutrition recommendations. That is my, <laughs> yes, <it's> good. <laughs> That's your real life recommendation. That is my real life. Okay. <laughs> Last one. The place that is on your to visit list next. Oh gosh. Um, so I've just come back from London and, uh, Dublin, so so Ireland and England, and I visited Canada, and I'm absolutely coming back to the states next year. So I'm going to go to California, um, coming to New York because um, I've got friends to visit in both places, and then I'm one hundred thousand percent coming to Vancouver, and I'm going to go back to Toronto. So I just had the best time in Canada. Uh, I'm just manifesting as hard as I can to come back. So hopefully in the fall I'll be back. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alice. You are an absolute delight. And I cannot wait for everyone to pick up your book in praise of veg now here in North America <laughs> and next year, the joy of better cooking. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Desiree. Thank you for having me twice. What a joy. 